Welcome to the Writing Tube presentation, Introduction to Resumes. Please follow along with this presentation by opening your Chapter 15 in How to Write Anything. Uh, we'll cover resumes. Please note that um, I do follow my own presentation based on material from How to Write Anything, and we are going to be specifically looking at resume examples in How to Write any, Anything. You can find lesson objectives on our course website, as always, and there will be a quiz on resumes and cover letters that you want to take after you have done both presentations. While your resume is a very different type of writing than what you're used to doing for academic and scholarly papers, you will still use some of the same skills, and that's why we're covering this in writing too, is because many of these same skills do apply. And we talk quite a bit in writing one about purpose and audience. And we continue that along, you know, throughout our college careers. We use these things for any paper we write. We want to consider purpose and audience, and that does apply to uh, resumes and cover letters, um, whether you're in college or after or whatever. You're going to think about those things. So first of all, let's think about our purpose in a resume. Well, in some ways, you're advertising yourself, and you're not going to be super flashy necessarily. But you do want to create a simple focus and a picture of yourself as a candidate for a job. And so you want to think, okay, what will do the best job of promoting me as the candidate, maybe the right candidate for this job? You also want to consider your audience. That's where some research really helps. And I know we talk about research quite a bit. Again, another skill that you're going to use quite a bit, uh, not just in college, but throughout your career. And in this case you're going to research and think about the specific company and you might do some looking into not just the job itself and trying to figure out okay what am I going to do with this job and uh, you know what's the job description of course you could look at those should look at those things and use those to plan your resume but you're also going to think about the specific company look to see what their values are uh, see what their goals are because you're going to try to show that you as a job candidate and as a person align well with their values and with their goals. So for example, if they say that they're very collaborative and they're you know, wanting team players and, and they have a certain vision for that within their company, then you wanna show that that's what you're able to do and that that lines up with your own values. So you're gonna look at those things and also you will look at the needs for this position. Um, as somebody who has interviewed people in the past, and well more in the future. Um, I'm a chair of a division when I'm recording this presentation. Um, I'm a chair of a division here at Ensola College and, and I interview people to come teach for us. And again, it's really irritating for everyone when you sit down to look through a resume and you realize this person didn't really look at the job description because if they had, um, he or she would have noticed that he or she does not really qualify for this job or that he or she is really trying to get a different job and they're just hoping to maybe get hired and go toward that other job um, through your job, which again can be really aggravating. So do some research, see what the position is going to require and go from there. Um, sometimes you'll be looking at jobs that you have no idea what the company is about. Um, you'll really need to do some investigation, but especially if you live in a small community, um, a smaller community, many people know each other, and often you can find out more information about the position and job itself just by sort of asking around or asking people who you know um, who either work for that company or who are familiar with them. So do your research. Again, consider purpose and audience as you plan your resume. Next we're going to talk about design for the resume, and I know uh, some students have taken computer literacy and you talked about resumes there. And you may have talked about design there somewhat. Um, I don't know if you really get into the reasons behind design, but I'm going to get into that. And in writing too, I tend to focus a lot more on content than that. And in writing too, I tend to focus a lot more on content than on design because this is a writing course, um, much more than what you would look at in a computer literacy class. Their job there is to teach you certain uh, functions and skills of the, the computer and how to do this on a computer. So let's talk about why we design a certain play way. Number one, one, the idea of six seconds. There's a study. I put the link to it at the end of this uh, presentation. You can always pause that and get that down. 
Um, it'll be in our sponsor supplemental resources part of our uh, course website for this week as well. Um, and this study basically did a survey uh, and a study on recruiters, on people who actually do hiring. And they actually had some software involved that um, measured and observed what these recruiters' eyes did when they were looking at resumes. And the idea is that the researchers wanted to know what parts of the resume the uh, recruiters actually looked at the most, what they spent most time on. And you can go to the link that I provide and you can read the whole report. It's really fascinating. They spend about six seconds looking at your resume. So you put all this time, all this effort, all this work into a resume and they spend an average of six seconds looking at it. Why is it significant? Well, that's how long you have to make an impression. That's how long you have to get their attention, to tell them what you want them to know. That's not very long. So how, how do we get their attention drawn to the right places in the resume? And you can, again, study and you can actually see where they look. So how can you do that? Well, you use white space. One of the sort of paradoxes here, I guess, of teaching resumes is, again, we in writing are often trying to encourage students to fill up that space, to put more writing in there, um, to keep developing, keep expanding. But, but with, with a resume, you want to use that white space. So your resume should have a lot of white space. In other words, space where there are no words. And if you look on page 301 of the Ruskowitz book, uh, How to Write Anything, you'll see a lot of white space on there. You will see a decent amount of, amount of typing and, and text there, but there's a lot of white space around it. Your eyes then are drawn to the, the major headings. So again, you want to use headings effectively. And this particular person, uh, Andrea Pelladino, um, has done a good job of putting these different headings over to the left and putting them in caps so that eyes are drawn to them. You can also use bold. Um, to highlight titles, that helps a lot. Um, that'll draw the eyes to it using crisp fonts. And there are, there are whole entire studies on which fonts you should use for documents like this. I recommend using Times New Roman as opposed to Arial or Calibri. Um, reason we want to use Times New Roman, um, the way that it's built, different fonts are built different ways. And they're not just randomly thrown together. They're built by people who study how people actually read and if you look very closely you can see that there's sort of a bottom line to Times New Roman or um, other fonts those are actually called serifs the little lines that kinda go along the bottom that creates sort of a bottom line for a readers eyes to rest and it makes it a little easier to read so when you have Times New Roman or Georgia or Garamond or, or um, Palatino Linotype those are all going to have that serif at the bottom and sort of have a nice way to draw readers eyes to it and make for easier therefore quicker reading you definitely want that you don't want them straining to see what you wrote so you'll want to use those um, and what other other tools might go into there um, for the writing itself you might want to use bullet points um, and if you don't use bullet points at the least use fragments and you can see uh, on Andrea's resume there she's using fragments she's um, after her career objective which is a complete sentence um, that kind of describes her um, under experience though you can see that she starts her sentence with verbs not just verbs but action verbs um, we'll get back to that in just a minute but so you can see that again that'll cut down on the amount of writing and that will help your design. Um, it's a less cluttered look. And as far as the order that your information should be in, um, some of that's going to be dependent on your own experience and your own skills that you want to highlight there. Now, there are times when an employer has you fill out an application and, and you know they want a very standard format because they want to be able to look at multiple uh, resumes or applications at once and know exactly where they're going to find the information. But when you're designing your own resume, it's sort of up to you what you put there. And you can see that Andrea puts education first on hers. Um, if you look at page 60 in the Hacker book, you can also see um, a resume there for Jeffrey Richardson. And you can see their, their resumes are very similar. 
Um, Jeffrey uses bold, uh, whereas Andrea doesn't. Um, and you can see that his dates are a little bit more laid out um, in terms of, of, he says fall and summer, and he uses those rather than um, specific months, and that might um, be partly because a lot of his experience has to do with schooling. Um, but you can also see as you go, as you go through it, um, look at look at the order of things, and they do have some similarities and some differences. They both have an objective first, which is a good. It's a nice thing to start with an objective, so the employer can see exactly what you want and what you're going for. Um, that can be sometimes very general, sometimes it's more specific, depending on what job you want to go for. And with the next sections then, you can see that education and experience are both in that same order. Um, but again, that's not written in stone that you have to do it that way. Um, you could very well put experience first, especially if your experience is what's more relevant to this job. Sometimes you want them to see, okay, I'm in the middle of my education, I'm doing a good job, I'm getting my education, and that's the most important thing to my life right now, so that's what you need to know when you look at my resume. But there are going to be other times, even when you're still in college, that you want them to see your experience right exactly for the job. And sure, they need to know that you're in college or you're taking classes and trying to finish, but you want their ex the experience to be the first thing that they see after that objective. So that's up to you on how you do that. What I usually recommend then too is think about the situation needs, your own strengths. Let's talk about the content in your resume. Again, this is where I'm going to be focusing most of my attention when I grade. You can look at the rubrics and see that um, because this is the writing component. Um, now. Also, under purpose and audience and thinking about those, one little piece of advice. Um, now, also under purpose and audience and thinking about those, one little piece of advice that I, I always give. As you start looking for jobs or as you're in a position where you might be interested in some different jobs, you're, you never really know what might come along. There are going to be times when you look and look and look for a job and it's really frustrating and you never think you're ever going to find anything. There are other times when just because of people you know or networking or just being in the right place and right time, you'll find out about jobs, but you'll need to apply very, very quickly. You also have times uh, when you may end up going to a job fair, and sometimes those can be really frustrating and they're all terrible jobs. People are, you know, sending recruiters to hotel lobbies and conference rooms for hours at a time. But you can find sometimes very good jobs at those uh, jobs fairs as well, some really good opportunities. So here's what I suggest. Um, when you're going for a specific job, then you definitely want to tailor your resume for that specific job. So you want to think about what they're looking for. You want to think about, again, how your skills and experience match that and, and you know, tweak your content and, and work on uh, what's in there based on what you think would fit best for that job. Then you should also have a general resume that you always keep available, that you always keep updated um, whenever you get some new experience or whatever else. You want to keep that updated so that if someone says, oh, you know, uh, we do have a position open. Do you have a resume you can send me? You can say sure, and you can go home. You can adjust it very quickly, and then you can send it. And that way they're not waiting for a week while you try to figure it out, or you're not sweating for three hours and up all night just trying to build a brand new resume for this. So always keep a resume around, and so you do kind of want to have a general one available. Um, and we we talk about uh, resumes in a lot of different ways, but but that is one piece of advice that I, I don't really really see around much, um, but I myself uh, found very valuable um, back when I was spending a lot more time looking for jobs. So okay, content itself. Well, you want to use reverse chronological chronological order. In other words, you're starting with your most recent job our most recent educational uh, piece first and then build backwards. backwards. Um, you want to focus on your skills and experience, especially if you haven't had a lot of jobs and maybe the jobs you had were not all that impressive. You want to focus on the skills you gained from those um, and you want to use descriptions and details that match the job listing or needs. Again, purpose, audience. Um, and if you look at the examples here, again, page 301 in the Roscoe's book, they have focused on 
sort of the skills and experience that they have. And so when they do their job descriptions in there, again, they're keeping it very short because they know their, um, their recruiters are not going to have very long to look at them. But they focus very specific jobs, very specific details um, and descriptions that let the recruiter know exactly what they did. Um, and you can see, uh, as you read through there, look, at, look specifically what they say their objective is, and then look to see how their job descriptions might line up with their objective, or how they maybe don't. And, and you, you want to include, uh, use fragments that start with action verbs. Um, in Andrea's, she doesn't use bullet points. Um, she has more of a paragraph style description. Um, I would say, usually the bullet points is a little better. You and the paragraphs um, that Andrea has, they're okay. That's not terrible. You could, you, you, could, you could definitely get a job having it that way. But if I'm looking at this really quickly, easier to find, they're easier to read. Uh, you want to use action verbs and use them you know, um, as much as you possibly can. And you can see every single description in Andrea's starts with, starts with action verbs. You'll want to do the same thing. Um, you also, in your resume, you want to include community engagement. And we don't like to use the term community service all the time. Um, service is a great word, but community service for many people corresponds with uh, things that you were required to do because you had a run-in with a lot, and so because you got caught doing something, you had to go pick up cans um, alongside of the highway or something. So. That's what people think of when they think about community service, silly as it is. So I would use things like community engagement, or you can see these um, students used or accomplishments. Whatever you want to use there is fine. Um, you want to, again, think about what information to include there. Um, and that's where maybe, you know, a little bit of research can help, but it may not. Um, but just think about that. You want to avoid info that might cause a negative bias. So there are certain things that you've probably done that are pretty broad in general. Um, or you'll do in the you'll do in the future that are that are good. Like if you're involved with student government or Phi Theta Kappa or something like that on the Ancilla campus, okay, you know those are great student organizations. They're pretty neutral. Um, they're pretty common things for college students to get involved with. When you get into religious activities, again, I think it's great if you're involved in religious activities, teaching Sunday school, helping with your church youth, whatever. Um, I personally have had a, many years of doing those things myself, and that's a big part of my life. And, and you know, I'm very grateful for the opportunity to do those things. But for some jobs that I've applied to in the past, that was not relevant. Now, in my job as a teacher, okay, yeah, it's relevant that I do teaching in a context outside of the school. Fine, you know, that works. Um, but you may not always want to put that on your resume if it doesn't apply to the job because you may have somebody who doesn't see the same way you do about that experience with a specific church that you um, list on your resume or something like that. So you want to be careful about that. Um, the same goes for political activities. Again, I hope that whatever party um, aligns with your beliefs, um, I hope that you are able to get involved if you care um, about issues. And, and I think it's... Um, not just the two major parties, but lots of other parties and lots of other organizations, they need people to be active. And, and again, I hope that whatever you believe, you're able to get involved and, and help causes that you strongly believe in. Um, I think that's a wonderful thing. But again, remember that on your resume, um, yeah, on your resume, um, your activity with, you know, um, the Republican Party or the Democratic Party, the people who read that may not care, but they may. That may create a bias. And should they discriminate against you based on those things or against on religion? Absolutely not. And it's actually illegal to discriminate against basis of quite a few things. But there's not really a documentation of them discriminating against you. If they're looking quickly at your resume, seeing a couple things that might turn them off, and then, you know, they might throw your resume in a different pile. They There's no documentation that they've discriminated. There's nothing that you know, anybody, anybody could actually look and say, you discriminate against me. So you want to not put yourself in that position. So just consider that. Um, you also want to avoid excess or outdated information. So at this point, some of you are 18 listening to this. Some of you are probably significantly older. Um, whatever age you are, there are things that as you continue in your careers, 
you start weeding out some of the things and the experiences that you had. So if you're 18 and you were in a play in eighth grade, you don't need to put that on your resume. Um, in fact, if you were in a play your senior year in high school and that was just, you know, a year ago, you may not need to put that on your resume. Hopefully you've done things more current or things that relate more to the job. Um, likewise, um, other things that you might have done just might be overkill. It might just be too much. You might want to, as you get engaged and do more things, you might want to pick and choose the things that do specifically relate to that job. And last, you want to proofread, proofread, proofread. I cannot say that too many times, but I won't keep reading it because we don't want to be here 20 minutes from now. you still hearing me saying proofread, proofread, proofread. But I mean it. Do it, do it, do it. It's very embarrassing to have a resume resume with typos on it and makes you look like a goofball and that's a nice way of saying it it makes you look sloppy and when you have a resume and you're supposed to have carefully crafted it but there are errors on it, this slide includes the uh, specific URL for the eye tracking study put together um, and presented on a website uh, called theladders.net um, they are a human resources related um, website. Uh, lots of other good stuff there too for you as you look for jobs. Um, and I encourage you to look at that. Um, you don't have to copy the URL down straight from here. You can find it on the suppl re Supplemental Resources uh, page within um, the same week um, on our course website as you can find the same presentation. All right. Thanks for listening, everybody. Now that you've watched this presentation, uh, Make sure that you um, look at the cover letter presentation if you haven't already, and then the job seeking more best pra practices presentation. Um, once you've worked through all three presentations, you'll be ready for the resumes and cover letters quiz. And of course, you need to be working on your own resume and uh, getting that in so I can get it graded. All right, have a great time.